coming up on Network Africa. Incumbent president of the Gambia, Adama Barrow, wins Saturday's presidential election. The United Nations warns conflict in northern Ethiopia continues to drive large-scale displacement and limited access to basic services. Plus, Nigeria criticizes UK's addition of the country to its travel red list. Thank you for joining us at this hour. Welcome to the program. I'm Layo Adigoki. Let's begin with stories and happenings that made headlines over the weekend. Polls closed in Gambia on Saturday, December the 4th, after citizens cast their votes for a president in a tightly fought race seen as a test of democratic progress. It was the West African country's first democratic elections since former President Yahya Jame was voted out of office in 2016. On Sunday, supporters of President Adama Barrow were celebrating the preliminary results. He's bringing difference in this country because in fraction of the country to develop the country, wherever he construct, wherever he construct road, in five years he beat James Redim. James was here for 22 years, but he spent only five years. The work he did is amazing. He's ahead of all these leaders that we have passed. Gambia uses a unique voting system. Marbles dropped into each candidate's ballot drum to avoid split ballots in a nation with a high illiteracy rate. At least 31 people in central Mali were killed by militants when they fired a bus taking people to a local market. Local authorities say this is the latest deadly attack in the region racked by violent insurgency. The bus was attacked by gunmen as it traveled its twice weekly route from the village of Songho to a market in Bandiagara. The governor of Bandiagara region, Mesa Afane, and other officials visited the attack site. <laughs> Sudan's military will exit politics after elections scheduled for 2023. General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan told Reuters in an interview on Saturday, December the 4th, adding that the deposed former ruling party will have no role in the transitional government. Following a military takeover led by Burhan in late October that sidetracked Sudan's transition to civilian-led democracy, a deal was struck on November the 21st, reinstating Prime Minister Abdallah Hamdok to lead a technocratic cabinet until elections in July 2023. The coup, which ended a partnership with civilian political parties after the ouster of Omar al-Bashir, drew international condemnation after the detention of dozens of key officials and crackdowns on protesters. South Africans took to their beaches on Sunday, December the 5th, to protest against plans by Royal Dutch Shell to do seismic oil exploration they say will threaten marine wildlife such as whales, dolphins, seals and penguins on a pristine coastal stretch. A South African court on Friday, December the 3rd, struck down an application brought by environmentalists to stop the oil major exploring in the eastern seaboard's wild coast, rejecting as unproven their argument that it will cause irreparable harm to the marine environment especially migrating humpback whales. It's actually just horrendous that they're even considering this. I mean, if you, you look around, you look at these people, you look behind us, you look along the coast, it's unacceptable and it's not going to happen. We will stop it. Everybody will oppose this. The wild coast is home of some of the country's most undisturbed wildlife refuge and its stunning coastal wildernesses are also a major tourist draw. Incumbent President Adama Barrow has won re-election in the Gambia in the first vote for decades without, held without long-term leader Yaya Jame. Officials say President Barrow received about 53% of Saturday's votes with nearest rival, a lawyer, Usanu Dabo, on 28%. Well, in the last election, Mr. Barrow defeated Yaya Jame, who now lives in exile after refusing to accept the results. The vote is being seen as a test for democracy in the country. 
In President Adama Barrow's victory speech, he promised Gambians he will do everything he can to make their lives better. Fellow Gambians, before December 2021, the presidential elections is now behind us. And democracy has taken its course in assisting us to choose lead this country for the next five years. <laughs> Having been the lucky person to be chosen by you, I sincerely assure you, each and every one of you, that I will do all I can and utilize every resource at my disposal to make the Gambia a better place for all. all. In the meantime, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has welcomed the completion of the work of the Gambian Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission, TRRC, and the submission of its final report to the President. Secretary General's spokesperson, Stefan Dujaric, made this known to journalists in New York. Mr. President, more than 35,000 people in the Secretary General welcomes the completion of the work of the Gambian Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission and the submission of its final report on November 25th to the President of the Republic of the Gambia. The Secretary General commends the Commission for its tireless work and urges the government to ensure speedy follow-up action on the recommendations contained in the report. Well, joining us now to discuss further on the Gambian election is African Affairs Analyst Declan Ihekeri. Good to have you on Network Africa. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Well, the election is over. The incumbent, Adama Barrow, has won. And uh, looking at where the country is coming from, what does this mean for the average Gambian? Yeah, thank you. Uh, we should not forget in the haste that uh, Gambia has been under the siege of uh, a seat tight uh, uh, leader uh, who, who by now has been um, sent on exile because of the attitude and character he exhibited while in office. And so now having uh, Baru, Adama Baru now as, as president and uh, the election was held and uh, he was declared the winner and uh, it shows a transitional movement uh, from a seat tight to a tenor uh, government. It means Gabians can now see tomorrow today. It means they, can, they, can, they, they have the power to, 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 to tell who becomes their leader, unlike what happens in the past where somebody somewhere decides the fate of the people. Uh, and, and such situation, you cannot hold that person accountable to anything. So at this point in time, Gabias should be happier because they have uh, a time limit for their president. They know when he's to go and when another one is to come. So it now behoves on whoever is at the helm of affairs to do the bid of the people. Because if you don't do the bid of the people and you feel your tenor will be over and you will go, you will end up putting your own party in jeopardy. That means other party might decide to, to, to come up and uh, use that as an electoral uh, uh, value against your party. Well, you know, some political analysts have said this election, Saturday's election, that they see it as a victory for democracy. Do you share this sentiment? What, 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 what to me, to me, uh, in Africa as a whole, election will come, election will go, and we call it democracy. Uh, the kind of democracy I expect to see in Africa is a democracy that transits beyond election. Uh, that goes into reforming and reshaping the life of, of the people. people. Uh, uh, an, an, an election or a democracy that really goes into the lifestyle of the people that brings about their thinking faculty, faculty for the positiveness of the, of the society. What do I mean by this? A situation where you have an election and you elect people, and once they get there, they forget where they are coming from. They forget the promises they have made to the people. I think that does not mean democracy as far as I'm concerned. Democracy should be a government that is given to you by the people and you have to take 
power back to the people and you must listen to the people that's the kind of democracy i expect at this point in time and i expect all over africa uh we we, we go out of the country we we'll, we see what happens in america and britain and uh, china and all those things in all those places what happens is that you see power given to the to, to to the people to the leaders and the leaders now go back to the people and do what the people want they listen to the people unlike here you see we voting them in and they won't listen to us. They want us to listen to them. That should not be. Well, we understand the opposition candidates, uh, some of them are rejecting this uh, results without really no specific evidence. What do you think here? I think it's, uh, it's a norm. It's a norm in Africa setting. Every politician sees himself or herself as a winner. Uh, I remember vividly some elections in this country some years ago. Even when somebody is aware of the fact that uh, he's, he's losing, you still hear him saying, I'm going to challenge the vote. Uh, no, no, I won, I won, I won. So they never give up. Mm -hmm. And moreover, I think uh, it, it happened in America recently too, where, where the former president you know, <laughs> had to say no, that he won the election. I think it's a mentality that, uh, that, should, be, that should be taken away in, in totality. It's not a good mentality. If you lose, you congratulate the winner. It's there. It's, there's nothing. There's not. There's nothing. There's nothing hidden. Once you're winning an election, you will know. And once you're losing, you will know. Except there's massive rigging and all those things. Then you can go to court and challenge. So, in as much as they are rejecting, I, I will implore them to go to court and challenge the, the outcome of that that that, uh, that election. All right, just very quickly, finally, uh, you were talking about, you know, promises from people that are in power. What would you say sh uh, should be pres the new president, Adama Barrow? What should he be his priority now that he's back again for another term? Yeah, Adama Barrow should understand the fact of where he was coming from. He should understand where uh, Gambia was, and he should know where Gambia is going. And uh, he should understand that the election he won now is as a result of the backing he had from the people. Uh, Gambia is about 2 point something million in population, and we understand more than a million people came out and registered for this election. And so it means a massive support for whoever won the election. And so he must be able to do everything humanly possible to make sure that downtrodden Gambia have something to gain from this government, knowing fully that Gambia has nothing. To, to celebrate as, uh, as, a, as a country, as, oh, it's a tourism state or a tourism country. So he has to do everything possible to make sure that the life of an average Gambian is touched for good. All right then, Declan Iherkari, African Affairs Analyst, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Moving on to other stories now, the conflict in Ethiopia. UN spokesperson Stefan Dujaric says the crisis continues to drive large-scale displacement and limited access to markets, food and basic services. However, there said to have been some improvements in the past week with four convoys with four, 157 trucks loaded with humanitarian supplies arriving in Mekele and that's representing the first humanitarian deliveries since the 18th of October. More than 35,000 people in debt. In Ethiopia, uh, in the northern part of the country, our humanitarian colleagues have advised us that the conflict there continues to drive large scale displacement, loss of livelihoods, and limited access to markets, food, and basic services. The latest numbers of people impacted are 3.7 million people in Amhara, more than half a million people in Afar, and 5.2 million people in Tigray. Of those, at least 400,000 are believed to be facing famine-like conditions. Our humanitarian partners have limited access to large segments of the population across these regions, though there's been some improvements in the past week. As we've told you, uh, between November 24th and November 30th, four convoys with about 150, with 157 trucks loaded with humanitarian supplies arrive in Mekele. Those were the first de deliveries since October 18th. Fuel, however, has still not arrived in Tigray via the Afar route since the 2nd of August, with eight tankers currently in Samara in Afar waiting for clearance to proceed. On the 24th of November, the U UN's Humanitarian Air Service resumed twice-weekly flights between Addis and Mekele following their suspensions on the 22nd of October. As a result, um, we, along with our humanitarian partners, have been able to rotate staff in and out of Tigray and transfer a limited amount of operational cash. 
At least 12 soldiers in Niger have been killed by gunmen in a clash in the southwest of the country. A government official says security forces came under heavy fire from hundreds of fighters near the village of Funio on Saturday. The official adds that dozens of militants had also been killed. Militants linked to the Islamic State group have been blamed for a wave of attacks in the Sahel region of West Africa in recent years. Uganda says its troops that were sent to the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo last week would stay as long as needed to defeat Islamist militants with the progress of the mission to be evaluated after two months. Uganda and Congo launched the joint operation against ADF rebels who bombed the Ugandan capital last month, but have so far shared few details about its size or expected duration, even as some voiced alarm about the presence of Ugandan troops on Congolese soil. At least 1,700 Ugandan soldiers have so far crossed into eastern Congo to join Congolese forces battling the allied democratic forces, the armed group aligned with Islamic State. Still ahead on the program. As part of efforts in encouraging vaccination, the government in Egypt have opened up vaccination booths across Cairo's malls. We'll give you more details. Please stay with us. Welcome back to the program. The Nigeria High Commissioner to the United Kingdom, Sharafa Tunji Shola, has described restrictions imposed on Nigeria by Britain as travel appetite. His comments are in line with the UN Secretary General, who raised concerns over measures imposed by various countries against African nations. The ambassador spoke with our London correspondent, Juliana Olainka. The position of Nigeria is to align with the position of UN Secretary General uh, that has classified the travel ban on Nigeria and some other African countries as travel apartheid. And uh, Nigeria aligns absolutely with that because what we're talking about, like I said, is not endemic. If, if uh, the Omicron variant is endemic, that means it's peculiar to, to a few countries, then you, you can understand that. But as of today, the official confirmation of Omicron patients in Nigeria just have three. And all over the world, we have so many countries that even have, uh, you know, uh, 200, 300, 400 percent over that of Nigeria. Yet, they are not included in the ban list. That's number one. Number two is the fact that uh, South Africa happened to be the first country that will bring the attention of the world to the existence of Omicron. And we must salute their efforts. Perhaps it did not even emanate from South Africa. Well, South Africa's President Yuri Ramaphosa says hospitals are preparing for more admissions as the country enters a fourth COVID-19 wave driven by the Omicron coronavirus strain. In his weekly newsletter, President Yuri Ramaphosa says the number of daily infections has increased fivefold over the last week. He's urging South Africans to get vaccinated, calling it an urgent priority that will also help economic recovery. Mr. Ramaphosa also encourages the use of face face masks, social distancing, and avoiding crowds to reduce the spread of the virus. As you shop at the mall in Egypt, you can also get your COVID-19 vaccine as the health ministry has set up vaccination booths at some of the city's malls. This is part of government's efforts in pushing vaccination drive where people can get an instant jab and also to encourage more people to get vaccinated amid fears of the Omicron variant. A total of 14 vaccination booths have been set up in Cairo's malls and metro stations to boost its coronavirus vaccination drive amid rising fears of the spread of the new Omicron variant. Similar booths have been set up in sports clubs and youth centers, and more than 96 registration centers have opened to help citizens register to get the vaccine. It will make Egypt a lot more safer because, um, for example, other countries who aren't getting vaccinated yet, they will have a lot more cases which will eventually lead to a lot more deaths. But 
I think it's important that Egypt, you know, gets vaccinated and so everyone will be safe, so it becomes a safer place. The country has not yet detected any case of the new variant, and health authorities say necessary measures are taken to monitor the situation across the country. Making vaccinations available in locations close to home or work saves effort and time. Instead of having to travel or wait somewhere, there are more locations now in Zayat Specialized Hospital, this booth here, and at Eli Club, and many other locations. We save time and the commute. Egypt, as with several other countries, has suspended direct flights to and from South Africa due to concerns about the new variant. The country has also announced it will activate a plan to offer COVID-19 vaccine booster shots for senior citizens, people with chronic diseases and healthcare workers, and last month authorized Pfizer's vaccine for children aged 12 to 15. More than 14 million people in Egypt have had two vaccine doses, and nearly 27 million have had one. Acting Health Minister Khalid Abdul Ghaffar said last month, the government has set a target of vaccinating 40% of Egypt's 100 million population by the end of this year. All still in Egypt, at least three children, two brothers and their sister, have been killed in the collapse of an apartment building in Egypt. Three other siblings were also injured. Six more injured people were rescued from the rubble of the collapsed two-story apartment building in the province of Beni Suez. Although well, it's not yet known what caused the collapse, but such incidents occur regularly in Egypt in poorer areas where many buildings are said to be badly constructed. A new two-year $6.2 million joint program on women, peace and protection has been launched in Mogadishu by Somalia's government and the United Nations. While well, this program is expected to support women's meaningful participation in peace, security and development in the effort to achieve the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. The ceremony was attended by international partners, representatives of federal member states and civil society groups, including representatives of persons with disabilities. It is public knowledge that women remain on the periphery of formal uh, peace processes and they are largely excluded from decision making. If sustained peace and stability were to be achieved, we need to address the rise in incidents of violence and misogyny, uh, the exclusion of Somali women from decision making, and a myriad of challenges uh, they are facing. This is um, the government, civil society, donors, and the UN will work together to implement this joint program and improve the inclusion and participation of Somali women in peace negotiations, as well as in parliament, judiciary, and security sector institutions. We fully endorse the joint program's focus on supporting women in Somalia as leaders and change makers and the promotion of women's led organizations to build peace and to support women's protection. Our support to women's led organizations uh, must be given in a sustainable way that recognizes the role that they play every day in the protection of women and girls across Somalia. We are now in the process of uh Nobel Literature Prize winner Abdul Razak Gurna has received his prize at a London ceremony. The Tanzanian, who was named winner in October by the Swedish Academy, has collected his medal for the 2021 Nobel Prize in Literature. The 72-year-old won the Literature Prize for his novels, unflinchingly portraying the effects of colonialism and the plight of refugees. Swedish ambassador to London, Michaela Kumlin Granit, presented the writer with his Nobel Medal and also a diploma. And customarily, you would have received the prize from the hands of His Majesty, the King of Sweden. However, this year you will be celebrated with a distance forced upon us because of the pandemic. And since you cannot go to Stockholm, your Nobel Prize medal and diploma 
has been brought to you here today. So with this regards, from the Swedish Academy and the Nobel Foundation, it is a great honor to convey to you my warmest congratulations and ask you to receive the Nobel Prize. Professor Emeritus of the Rosa Gurna, please step forward. And that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Adibuki.